All right, so welcome everyone. This is our Science of Beetles today. So like I mentioned, I have a lot of information, um, but I always do. So um, we'll see how this uh, is gonna go today. There we go. All right, so like I mentioned, we're gonna talk about beetles today. There is a lot of stuff that we're gonna cover today. Uh, we will just go ahead and get started. All right, so if you've been to a science of before, you kind of know this. If you've never been before, welcome. Um, but if you do have questions, Amber said, go ahead and put them in the chat. Just make sure that they are relevant to what we're talking about and that we are nice to everyone. Um, otherwise, you we will um, have to um, ask you to leave or just actually kick you out. Um, but I don't think we'll have any issues with that. So. All right, another thing I just want to point out, I am by no means any expert in any of these subjects. I do a lot of research. I have talked to a lot of people kind of confirming these information. Um, so please do not feel that I am the know-all be-all. And if you um, have any questions that I can't answer or Amber can't find a link for, we will find someone that can answer those for you. So at the very end of this, um, I will send everyone that registered an evaluation and an email um, with some resources in it. And like I mentioned, if you have any questions, just email me back and we can um, figure those out. So, all right. So we're going to get a little bit into kind of what a beetle is. And then there's a lot of beetles out there. I don't know if you know anything about them. You're going to hopefully learn today. Um, but we're going to go through some of the families that we have here in Nebraska and those characteristics of those families. And then also some really interesting at the very end, some worldwide beetles that are very uh, unique and that are actually being used for um, different um, purposes for people to imitate kind of what they what they do naturally and put them into something that um, we can hone into that as well. So let's go ahead a little bit and talk about just what are beetles. So if you are a bug nerd or if you just kind of like to observe and are a naturalist, um, beetles are everywhere. They are the most common type of insect um, that you're going to find. So there's a lot of different types of beetles. There's about 350,000 in the world. And this is kind of a hard number to pin down. I saw 350, I saw 360, I saw 400. Um, so there's a lot of beetles out there. No one can confirmly say we have this many. There's always new species that are discovered. They believe some species that we already know were actually subspecies or different species completely. So things are constantly changing as far as this order of beetles, which is called Coleoptera. So this is, like I said, the single largest group of animals on earth. So I want you just to kind of think about that for a second, the single largest group of animals on the entire planet. So um, this is a very diverse group. Um, when we talk about them, um, they eat many different things. Sometimes they're fungus eaters. Sometimes they predate on other vertebrate animals. Um, uh, sometimes they're parasites um, for other animals. They're scavengers, they're plant feeders. They're just this huge diversity as far as what they look like, their colors, their shapes, their mouth parts, their antenna. Um, we'll learn all about about that today. But they virtually occur in every um, terrestrial and freshwater environment. If you go somewhere, you're probably going to see some type of beetle. I mean, there's, you know, 350,000 of them ish in the world. Hopefully you will see one of them. Um, so within the families that we're going to talk about today, you will notice some kind of um, characteristics that are very similar between the families. And I mean, that's how we group things taxonomically is because they have similar characteristics. So we're going to talk a little bit about those today. All right, so this group of Coleoptera, this simply means sheath wing. So their first pair of wings has actually been thickened and hardened onto their exoskeleton, and they're called the elytra. So um, on this pretty beetle here, you can kind of tell those black and uh, yellow kind of zebra-shaped patterns. Those right there, those ones that are hanging down, those are the elytra. So these actually are the hardened ones that cover up those very delicate hind wings. Um, that kind of fold up when they're not in use. And then Coleoptera, most of them, if not all of them, go through what we call complete metamorphosis. So you may have heard metamorphosis talked about with fish or butterflies, um, same concept. So it's just that life stages. Um, so when we talk about a complete metamorphosis, so from the time that they are an egg to a larva, um, to go through pupa and uh, to their winged adults, there's four stages. Um, other animals like grasshoppers or praying mantises, they only go through three stages. They totally skip that pupa stage and instead just go through something called instar stages where they just slightly get bigger every time. Um, but complete metamorphosis is something very unique to this group of uh, insects. Um, but they're, the way that they do it is very different between species. They all do the egg, larva, pupa, winged adult, 
but it sometimes takes some uh, insects longer than others, or some have several generations per year where only some have one. Um, so like I mentioned, it's just kind of between the species and between the groups of those um, beetles that we're going to talk about. And then some of them, when they're grouped together, they have similar feeding habits. Um, sometimes the larva and the adults, which we'll see today, have completely different types of feeding and the way that they forage and what they eat. Sometimes they're the same. Sometimes they live in completely different environments. Um, normally, they do have the chewing mouth parts, um, which we will talk about today. They've just kind of been altered to fit the type of food that they're eating. Um, but overall, they will have what we call chewing mouth parts. All right, so beetles, if you're not familiar with animals, is it a beetle? Is it a true bug? Is it a cockroach? It's sometimes really hard to tell because they look very similar to each other. Um, so beetles often get mistaken for other types of animals, especially um, cockroaches and true bugs. So what does it mean when I say true bugs? I put true bugs suck on there because not because they're bad or I don't like them, um, but literally they suck. Um, they suck up things. So um, a true bug, what we would call would be like your cicadas that you're seeing now, the leaf hoppers, even bed bugs are true bugs. So they have a sucking mouth part on them. Um, so when I say true bugs suck, that literally means that they do, they suck up their food. Um, whereas beetles, they have those chewing mark parts instead. Um, beetles will also have very distinct um, segmented antenna. So as you can see within this um, large diversity of three beetles that I have here, their antennas, if you look close enough, they're segmented into pieces and it's not one single long filament like in a butterfly or something like that. Uh, the larva are also of the beetles are gonna have many different names. Sometimes people call them borers, grubs, rootworms, wireworms, uh, sometimes glowworms if you're talking about fireflies, uh, which we will talk about later. Um, but then also the size range is a lot different too. Sometimes these beetles are going to be almost microscopic. Sometimes they could be six inches or larger. So that's a fairly good sized beetle. And then some beetles, not all, and some beetles will actually produce sound. So um, they do this by rubbing one part of their body against another part of their body producing a sound. Um, we're not really sure exactly why they do this, but we have theories that it is either something defensive, it's to communicate to different sexes between a male and a female, or also it might be for the larva to find each other. So um, there's lots of different reasons that these uh, beetles would need to make noises. All right, so when you look at a beetle, what um, body parts are you looking at? So I thought this was important because we're gonna be mentioning these things a lot um, in the families that we go through and it's helpful to know these before we get started. Um, so like many other insects, um, you've probably heard the head, shoulders, knees and toes song. Um, there's also a song that goes head, thorax, abdomen. Um, so beetles are gonna have three major body parts to them. Um, the head, the thorax and the abdomen. So the abdomen, is going to be this like segmented, basically the tail end of the animal. It's going to contain their organs like their heart, their reproductive organs, and pretty much most of their digestive system. So if you look under this beetle here, this abdomen is kind of this main area back here. The thorax then is going to be the middle section. Um, this is where the legs and the wings attach. And then you have the head. Um, of course, this is gonna be at the front of the body. The brain is gonna be here. They have compound eyes, which just simply means that they, each eye has like eyes inside of it. And I will show you that uh, picture here in a second. Um, and it also has the mouth, the pharynx, which is basically the cavity between um, the nose and the mouth, and it connects the esophagus. Um, beetles don't necessarily have a nose, but I put that in there so you kind of could figure that out where anatomy wise that would be. And then the two antenna will also attach at the head. Um, so antenna is going to be very different between species, but it is going to be segmented. So in different parts, um, and they usually have two segmented antenna. So they're um, symmetrical to themselves. And so these are mostly used to smell or kind of feel their way. Um, some antenna in some beetles has been modified for um, mating or even a defensive posture. We will show you a couple today that um, they will use them to defend themselves and even to fight off other beetles. 
All right, so their compound eye, when I mentioned this, this is a huge close up here, but they have two big eyes and then each of those eyes contains many what we call hexagonal lenses. So they don't necessarily see one single picture like we do, they see um, multiple things that kind of form into one image. Um, this really can show um, multiple adaptability depending on what type of um, species or what group of families we're talking about. Um, for instance, like whirling beetles, their eyes um, they sit and they can see above the waterline and below the waterline at the same time, which is really neat. Um, not all insects can do that. And then they also have this thing, which makes beetles kind of beetles, is their elytra. So these are the hardened, the exoskeleton four wings that basically protect those underneath, those really fragile wings underneath. Um, this photo here kind of shows um, this in like majorly in your face, but here's the elytra on there. And then the hind wings will be attached underneath. Um, the hind wings then are used for flying. And then when they're not in use, they're tucked under the elytra and sometimes they're even used for swimming. So there are beetles that are aquatic um, and then they use them for swimming. Their legs, so they are insects, which means they have six legs, not eight, they have six. And they also bear claws, um, usually one pair. It's sometimes hard to see it in some species. Sometimes it's pretty easy to see them. It just kind of depends. Um, and then like, again, the legs are very adapted. So some beetles will bury themselves. Some beetles will swim. Some beetles will climb trees. And then also their mandibles or their pincher mouths, um, their mouth parts. Um, again, these are very um, diverse, depends on what they eat and what they're um, foraging for, um, but they're very similar to grasshoppers. They sometimes will have large pinchers or even like tooth-like structures and the beetle. All right, and then here's like a side view. So they have these things called maxillary pelts, um, which are kind of up here at the front. They're kind of small and hard to see, um, but they're basically like these two little fingers that will kind of stuff food and move it into their mouth. Um, this helps them because, you know, they don't have forks and they, they can't use their hands or um, anything. So they have little things when they're moving around to push food into their mouth. Um, so how do they breathe? Um, so beetles will have these things called spiracles on them. And they're basically little openings around the beetle um, that will lead to respiratory, um, their system. Um, they're valve-like structures that basically open and close with the contraction and release of muscles. And they also, um, very hard to see if you look at the beetle, but up close under a microscope, they have these tiny little hairs um, that basically filters out particles before it gets into the beetle system. So this would be like dust or water or even parasites. And basically this pump system moves the air in and it pushes the, the carbon dioxide out. They're very efficient at shutting when they need to, to reduce that water loss. Um, and basically, like I mentioned, it's the muscles around these spiracles that close them and open them. So to close them, they contract, and then to open them, the muscle will relax to let that air in. And you can see the spiracles um, kind of shown on this drawing here, these little holes towards the back of the abdomen. All right, so that's just a little bit about like what beetles are, um, kind of where they're at in the world, and just a little bit about their uh, very um, simple anatomy of them. All right, I don't think we have any. Okay, awesome. No questions. No right? questions. Okay, thank you. All right, so now I'm going to get in a little bit to the beetle families. Um, there's like 40 some beetle families. I did not go through all of them. I tried to really hit the ones that people would be familiar with or ones that we have here in Nebraska. So we'll go ahead and get started with those. All right, so, and please forgive me. I Googled how to say some of these names because they're not my forte of pronunciation. So if I mispronounce them, I'm very sorry. Um, so this is the Curculonidae family, which are the weevil family. So when you think weevils, you don't necessarily think something beneficial. They're like the bugs you get in your flour or your rice or your beans. Um, but actually looking at them up close, they're adorable. They look like little elephants with their trunks. Um, so these are the weevil families. They're one of the most diverse group of insects. Um, there's about 3,000 species of weevils just here in North America. Um, and their defining kind of characteristic, like I mentioned, is that elephant-like proboscis. So if you're familiar with the word proboscis, um, that would be also like on a butterfly, um, the thing that rolls up that they suck the, the nectar or the pollen out of. Um, it just depends. It can be short, it could be wide, it can be long and slender. Again, it just depends on the species and what they're using 
using it for. But the mouth parts are very, very small and that they're very at the very end of that proboscis. So you can't even see them in this photo, but they would be at the very end of this um, mouth part that they have. Um, their head is very small and elongated and kind of leans forward to fit in with that snout. Um, the antenna are a little different. They do protrude from the snout or that little proboscis area here. And then as a common defense, some um, of these beetles like the rice re weevil, they actually do fly. A lot of people don't know that, but they can fly. They do have wings. Um, some of them also just play dead when they're disturbed. So a lot of people will see them and think, oh, they're dead. But no, nope, truth is they're just playing it. And then also many of them have scales. Um, so it's very hard to age weevils because the scales will simply rub off over time and depends on their environment. If they're moving through small little openings, um, those scales can rub off very quickly as well. Um, nearly all weevils are vegetarians. So these are gonna be the plant chewers, the herbivores of the group, um, even in the larval and adult stages. So this is just one that um, they have the same type of food depending on the um, life cycle part that they are in. All right, so I tried to pick, um, so I'll do the family, and then I decided to choose an animal, um, a, a beetle that is in that family that we might be familiar with. So we have something called an acorn weevil in Nebraska. And if you guessed it, they do have something to deal with acorns. Um, again, that long proboscis, this is a very close up of what they look like. But the females will lay a fertilized egg into the soft tissue of a green acorn, a very young green acorn. So as the acorn grows, the larva will feed on the inner part of the acorn. When the seed drops, the larva will crawl out. Um, so over time, it will then go into the soil. And then over the winter time, it will spend um, hidden in the winter. And then it will pupate and then develop into an adult later. Um, this sounds like not very good for the acorn tree. Um, it can, if there's a huge infestation of these weevils, it can inhibit the oak tree expansion um, and it could make seeds less viable. But overall, if there's a few of them, it really does not hurt the tree. Um, but they do have natural predators. There is a weevil wasp that is um, like kind of like the cicada killer wasp. It has a definite mission that it will only parasitize the weevil um, uh, larva. So it will lay its eggs on the larva as the wasp eggs hatch. It will then eat the larva of the um, of the weevil. So there are natural predators for this animal. All right. So this is the Chrysomelidae family. These are your leaf beetles. So these are very pretty animals. Um, they kind of look like the Japanese beetles if you're familiar with them. They're the third largest family in the Coleoptera. There's about 37,000 described species, maybe more because these are ones that are hard to find. Some of them, um, people are grouping them together, but they might actually be two species. And then just in North America alone, we have 1,700 species. Um, these guys, as the name kind of suggests, if you're um, a taxonomic nerd and you're reading through that, that chryso, um, that might make you think of plants. Well, you're right. These guys are very much associated with plants and oftentimes they will only, they're host specific, so they will only feed on certain types of plants. Um, same with their larva. And then also um, some species can actually cause damage to crops. Um, adults are usually small, um, but they're often brightly colored and sometimes metallic. This is one of those species that is metallic. Um, and then they have small little hairs or scales all over their body. And then their body shape is generally like I don't know, like a normal looking beetle. It's very ovate or it's elongated. Um, the larvae are called grubs and they do feed on foliage. And sometimes they will also eat the roots like underneath your grass or different parts of your plants. One of these guys, when we think about pests, we think of bean leaf beetles. So this is kind of what they're called and what they look like. They might be different colors. Sometimes they're green, sometimes they're um, yellow. It just kind of depends. Um, they're very close relative of you're familiar with the spotted cucumber beetle. Um, the pattern varies, the color varies. Some are green, some are brown, some are red. It just, it just kind of depends on where you're finding them. Um, but the sides have these like um, the wings that are triangular. And then um, these guys are really going to be your field and your crop pests. Um, they feed on beans, the shelled peas, snap peas, zucum cucumbers, zucchinis, basically anything. Um, so how do you know if you have these infestation? Um, the beans will experience brown spots on the pods, and usually there's going to be a ton of holes in your leaves. So if you're seeing stuff in your garden with a bunch of holes, it might be some type of leaf beetle. It might not be the bean, but it could be the spotted cucumber. They're very closely related to each other. Um, these guys have a cool defense technique. Um, when they're scared, they tuck their legs in and they just roll. They just fall off. 
off. Um, that's so that if something tries to eat them, they can get away very quickly. Um, and then the females will actually lay their eggs at the base of a host plant. And then when they're ready to hatch, um, they will crawl up the plant and then eat it. So that ensures that their babies can have something to eat. All right, so this is the, um, let's see, the Coccinellidae family, I'm trying here. Um, these are your lady beetles. So these are ladybird beetles or ladybugs, sometimes people call them. This is usually like one of the favorites for people as far as insects, because usually people aren't scared of ladybugs and they know what they look like. So um, if you ever think of the grouchy ladybug, um, he will eat a lot of aphids. So um, they have these polka dot or stripe patterns um, and they eat a lot of aphids. So sometimes they can eat about um, 5,000 aphids in their lifetime, which is helpful for us. Um, they're often recognized by their orange, yellow, um, kind of black, reddish spots, some type of pattern of black, red, yellow, spot, stripes, something. There's about 6,000 of these um, ladybird, ladybugs are worldwide. In North America, we only have about 480. However, some of them are invasive, which you might have heard before. Um, they do this thing when they're scared or when they're in defense technology mode here is called reflex bleeding. So they will secrete a very like sticky, um, irritating chemical for other animals um, from the knee joints when they are threatened. So it really wouldn't hurt a person, but if you're a bigger bug trying to eat them, that is something that they um, use as a defense. The larva also can do their, um, the complete reproduction. Like I mentioned, those four stages, the larva of these guys looks completely different from the, um, adult beetle, which again is part of that complete metamorphosis, but very few people know what like a baby ladybug looks like. And I'll show you a photo here. Um, but like I mentioned, some are invasive, some have been introduced on purpose. Um, this is one that's actually invasive that we see quite often in Nebraska. They're known as the seven spotted lady beetle which looks like your classic ladybug. They're also known as C7. I don't know why. I'm guessing the seven is the number of spots. Um, has been spreading accidentally um, introduction into New Jersey in the 70s, um, which is funny because they had a bunch of failed attempts to introduce this on purpose into Europe in 1956 and 1971. But in New Jersey, it just I guess it took and it, they've just kind of spread across the country. Um, so they have seven classic spots on them. They look very similar to like that classic ladybug that you're going to find. Um, it's really hard to tell the species of ladybug by just simply counting the spots. It's like a good indicator, but then there's always an exception. Um, instead, it's the thorax pattern. So looking at that middle section of the ladybug, that's what you're going to look at. Um, the Asian ladybugs usually have a W on the top of their thorax, whereas the other ones do not. Um, these guys will overwinter um, in leaf litter um, or under tree bark. And like I mentioned, they can eat as many as 5,000 aphids in a single lifetime. So you might be thinking, what's the big deal if they're invasive, they're eating those aphids. Yes, that's true, but they're also out competing our native ladybugs um, as far as food and as far as their um, habitat. So that's something that we do not like as well. And then here's what a baby ladybug looks like. This is obviously zoomed in, but if you ever like lift up the leaf and you see these guys, this is the... Um, the like <clears throat> caterpillar stage, basically the larva stage of a ladybug. So here it will turn into the, do the pupa and then turned into a winged adult. Whoops. All right. So this is your scarab. So your um, scarab bay day family. Um, so these are your scarab beetles. They're incredibly diverse, just like with all the rest of our beetles. Um, a few of them could be considered pests. But overall, they are valuable decomposers, um, and a lot of other animals eat these guys. So our skunks, our bats, um, lots of other small mammals will eat them. Some birds will eat them. So they're very helpful. Um, they do have C-shaped grubs. Um, these guys are actually consumed a lot by moles, and a lot of flies and wasps will actually parasitize, again, lay their eggs on the grub, and then they will eat the grub slowly from the um, outside in. Um, so they have relatively like stout bodies. They're kind of short, fat, chunky little beetles. Um, there's about 1,700 species just in North America alone. And these guys, their antenna are very different. So they have like clubbed antenna, and then um, their plates kind of fit together. And then there's like a club on top of them. Uh, so the outer ed edges and the front are toothed. Um, this helps them dig. So if you looked at their front legs here, they have almost like serrated little pieces. These guys are diggers and they use that to dig.
Um, they can also dig about two to three meters into the ground. Anything for a tiny little bug, that's, um, excuse me, a tiny little beetle, that is um, actually pretty cool. So you might be familiar with a lot of different scarabs. One of those is the dung beetle. So these guys come in a variety of colors. People think that they're just kind of brown and boring. That's not true. Some of them are bright red, some of them are metallic green. Uh, these guys are super important, not only into our ecological services, but also the ancient Egyptians thought very highly of this animal. Um, they called it the scarab. And if you've ever seen the mummy, um, probably scared you, but they are very important to that culture. Um, they believed that it kept the earth revolving um, like a giant ball of dung, basically. And that's what the dung beetles do. Um, some of these guys will have horn-like structures, which the males will use to fight. Um, otherwise, they have spurs on their back legs to roll the dung. And if you've ever seen dung beetles roll the ball, they do it with their back hind feet. Um, it also depends on the um, type or the, the stage that they are in as far as their life cycle. So the um, adult dung beetles, there is they use a lot of the dung from herbivores. So this dung will contain the grass. And then this really smelly liquid, this is what the adult beetles will feed on. The young beetles will eat more of the dung itself. Um, so they have special mouth parts for chewing those. Um, but just because you're a dung beetle does not mean you actually eat just dung. There's some that eat mushrooms. There's some that eat carrion or dead animals. Um, some of them just eat decaying leaves and fruits. But overall, the group of dung beetles is divided into rollers, tunnelers and dwellers. So rollers are actually going to bury their ball either all the way um, to munch on it later or to simply just lay their eggs in it. Um, tunnelers will, because probably like you mentioned, is um, they will use their dung um, burying in a, in a tunnel. And then dwellers, they literally just live inside of it. So it just kind of depends on what they're using it for. Um, but one thing that's also really neat is these guys, uh, these dung beetles, they represent this really cool group of insects that does things that other insects do not do, but more things, um, behaviors that you see in as far as like birds and mammals. So the way that the mates will interact with each other, um, the male and the female will basically compete with um, the dung and they get it out of there very quickly so that they can use that to lay their eggs in it. Um, and one thing that's really neat is they also use the sun to navigate during the day and the stars to navigate it at night. So um, we will actually do a night sky ecology um, science of, I, I don't think it's in this group or it might be in the next one, either in the fall, but we will talk more about dung beetles there as well. All right, so this is the Cincindelidae family. Um, these are your tiger beetles. So probably my favorite group of beetles just because they have some really cool adaptations on them. And I recently got to release some tiger beetles um, a couple weeks ago, which was cool. I've never done that before. Um, so just in North America, there's about 2,600 species and they are called the wolves of the insect world. Um, so these guys, if you look at their face, um, that very first photo I showed you, the science of beetles, that was the close-up of a tiger beetle. So they have these wicked jaws, they have these huge bulging eyes. Um, basically they find their prey and then they chase it. So they have ants, caterpillars, aphids, small invertebrates, whatever they can find, they will eat it. Um, they have these huge pinchers. Um, and the way that they do it is actually pretty gruesome. They will bang whatever they grab um, against the ground to kill it. And then they will suck out the insides. And then if they're still hungry, they might even eat some of that crunchy exoskeleton. But they are the fastest known species of insect. They can run about 5.6 miles per hour. Um, and one thing that's super neat, and I remember our, bio, our zoologist told us this one time, is that they run so fast that everything around them kind of blurs and they literally have to stop and orient themselves and then they can run again. They run, run so fast they can't see where they're going. Um, but the larvae look like little caterpillars and they will live in these cylindrical burrows about a meter down and they spend about two years as a larva species in that burrow. Um, but they also are a good indicator species. So um, these guys live in very specific habitats and if you're not finding them, that could be an indication of something gone wrong or if you're finding a lot of just certain species, what's going on with the other ones. All right, so in Nebraska, we do have tiger beetles. We have a very rare insect, actually one of the world's rarest insect is the Salt Creek tiger beetle. So um, 
You might have heard of this before, but it is locally listed, uh, federally, sorry, and state as an endangered species. So um, they were once known to occur in Lancaster and Saunders County, but unfortunately now it is only Lancaster County. So um, the saline wetlands is something that they really need as their habitat. Um, those um, mud flats and the salty areas um, with the salt deposits, that is their key habitat. So um, they're metallic to dark brown. Sometimes they have an olive green color on them. Um, and the males and females, like I said, they're about a half inch long or so, and they spend a majority of their life underground. So they are very, um, not adults for very long. Um, they spend most of their time as a, as a larva. Um, and right now, the Omaha Henry Dorley Zoo and the Rasta Game of Parks and now the Lincoln Children's Zoo are working together. They're raising tiger beetles um, in captivity to hope to uh, release them back into the wild. So the ones that we released um, a few years ago or a few weeks ago, sorry, um, were actually from the Omaha Zoo and they were um, uh, taking care of them until we can release them, which is a really cool conservation story. All right, this is the Carabidae family. These guys are just kind of like your everyday ordinary beetle. There's nothing, in my opinion, like super distinct about them, um, but they look like a beetle. If you've ever seen just, when you stereotypically think of a beetle, this is it. Um, but these guys are the second largest family in North America. These are the ground beetles. There's about 40,000 species worldwide. Um, they're usually dark in color and they're shaped like a jelly bean. Um, they have really long legs um, and they have very powerful mandibles and they're voracious predators. So they hunt primarily, the adults will hunt on the surface, the larva will hunt below the soil. Um, they eat a variety of foods. Um, they eat not only other insects, but there are some that also will eat seeds and then the weeds as well. Uh, they're mostly nocturnal. And then again, they go through complete metamorphosis. So those four stages. The one that we have in Nebraska is called the big headed ground beetle. Um, this is what it looks like. They have these, like I said, those huge pinchers on them. They actually are indigenous to North America, Central America, and parts of the Caribbean. Um, they have this basically black shiny body. Um, they're found on forest floors, grasslands, gardens, pretty much everywhere. Um, if you lift up a log or a rock, you'll probably see one of these guys. Um, they feed on caterpillars, the maggots, uh, snail slugs, ants, pretty much anything. And farmers actually really like these guys, or they should like them, um, because they eat a lot of pest insects, especially in crop fields. So um, these guys, when you have a lot of them, they're eating a lot of those pesty insects that we do not like. All right, so here's your Cerambycidae family. These are your longhorn beetles. So these are gonna want, have ones that are very, very long antennas. Um, a lot of them, this includes like your borers or your wood borers. Um, there's about 900 species in North America. The larvae are gonna be the borers until they get um, into the winged adults and they feed or found mostly in dead and decaying wood. Um, if you've ever seen the like serpentine paths inside of a log, um, that is usually one of these guys. So uh, we also think of like the emerald ash borer as being something that's invasive and bad, but not all borers are bad. Um, they also will mine live plants, not just like dead or dying wood. Um, and then the adults have the super long antennas. The males are going to be longer because of mating reasons. Um, when they are held, some species will actually squeak by rocking their heads back and forth. And then a few of them, like I mentioned, are pests but a lot of them help recycle dead wood into the soil. So one of the pictures I wanted to show you is if you've ever seen something like this, those serpentine paths, this is the wood borer. They are simply eating and feeding on that decaying wood. Um, one of them that is an invasive species that has not, to my knowledge, been found in Nebraska yet, but could potentially be one, is the Asian longhorn beetle. Um, this is what they look like. They have incredibly long antennas. Um, they have these spots on them. They're sometimes kind of a bluish color. Um, the larvae are white and grow up pretty long, about an inch and a half to two inches long. Um, but the good thing is, I guess, they only live about one year. Um, so they don't live very long, but still they cause a lot of damage. It was first found in New York in 19, 1996. It spreads through the movement of wood products. So one of the things that you can do to help that is don't move firewood. Don't, um, if you can help it, don't, uh, or avoid moving like log products anywhere. Um, I'm sure a lot of us are doing that. Um, so they are a huge threat to hardwood trees though. They can devastate um, tire industries if there's a lot of these guys. Um, so they, to be honest, they, they look like they're coming this way, but let's hope not. 
All right, this is your Lampyridae family. Um, the lamp, maybe you can guess, these are your fireflies or your lightning bugs. But they are neither flies nor bugs, they are beetles. Um, there's about 200 species just here in North America. Most of the time you don't see them west of Kansas just because they like deciduous areas. Um, but the adults usually rest during the day. They fly between dusk and midnight, pretty much the time when you see the lightning bugs outside or the fireflies, whatever you want to call them. But they lay their eggs in very damp soil and their larvae are carnivorous. So um, some species will also glow and they are called glow worms. Some species don't, um, but both the male and the females produce a light and it's a special organ producing or light producing organ that is underneath the abdomen um, called a cold light. Um, because when you touch it and it's a light, it does not produce any heat. So if you touch a lightning bug after it's been um, producing a lot of light, it will not be warm, it's cold. Um, the light is then created when oxygen combines with a substance called luciferin, and then that presence of the enzyme um, basically cause, causes all those cells to light up. So um, there's a lot of different beetles as well that look very similar to this. Um, we'll get into the soldier beetles are also very mistaken for um, different types of lightning bugs, um, but here's what just kind of a normal, I guess, lightning bug looks like. All right, so the Gyrinidae family, uh, if you mentioned, remember earlier, um, the whirling beetles, this is what they look like. Um, so there's about 900 species worldwide. It's kind of a smaller family. They're generally black or metallic, and these guys are aquatic. So um, they, they actually possess abdominal gills. Um, they swim to the surface um, pretty much undisturbed, but if they are disturbed, they'll dive quickly. They're very good swimmers. Um, most species are found in very oxygen rich habitats with a lot of vegetation on them. Um, they have paddle like um, middle and uh, hind legs, and they actually have about when they thrust or when they move, they have about an 84% thrust efficiency, which is the best in the animal kingdom. Now, animal kingdom, all animals, these guys have the best thrush efficiency when they move their legs. Um, they also use echolocation. So we think of bats or whales or dolphins. Well, insects can use it too. So when they move, they create waves. It's a little different than bats, but we, they do call it echolocation. So it helps them locate their drowning prey. Um, and these guys are also huge voracious predators. So um, it's neat to see them. But these are the ones that have the cool eyes where they are sitting on the surface and they can see um, the water level, they can see above it and they can see below it at the same time. So this helps them catch their prey. Oops. All right, so this is the Cyphilidae family. These are your carrion beetles. Um, another small family, just about 30 of them in North America. Um, several of them do eat carrion, which their name says. Um, so these guys will eat the dead animals. These are our recyclers and our decomposers. They're usually pretty flat. Um, they have the elytra and they have really distinct shapes. And usually what happens is if you see a carrion beetle, it looks like their elytra are just a little bit short. Um, they don't usually cover about the one to three segments of the abdomen in the back. That's a huge indicator that it is a carrion beetle. Um, their antenna are very clubbed. And if you look closely in this picture, um, you can see it looks like a club on top here, the tip. Um, these guys can also secrete a very bad smelling substance as a defense, or they just might smell really bad in general because of what they do. Um, some of them can be pests when you get lots of them, but they do provide a very big service for us. They transform all of these rotting corpses of different animals into something that um, into, back into the environment. All right, we do have one in Nebraska that is endangered federally and state. This is our American bearing beetle, pretty cute. Um, so these guys are actually the largest member of the family in North America, um, and they feed on dead animals, so for their reproduction. Um, so they feed and lay eggs on dead animals, and again, they help recycle that nutrients back um, from the dead animals to the ecosystem. Uh, these guys look very similar to other bearing beetles, but the main difference is that they have um, this large orange spot um, basically on their head, um, which is not common in other insects. So when people do bearing beetle surveys, they're looking for that orange spot on their head um, that they can identify them because there are other ones that look very similar to these. Um, 
So there's only very small populations in about six states, Nebraska, the Sand Hills, and the Les Canyons are critical for their habitat. Um, like I mentioned, they were listed as bait, um, federally and state endangered in 1989. Um, and because actually of light pollution and human expansion, it has led to their decline. So they are one of our declining species. All right, so this is your Dytisidae family. These are your predaceous diving beetles. So again, another aquatic one. Um, these guys are called water tigers because they are fierce. Um, about 4,000 species, 475 in North America. These guys are, they can get rather large um, and they can feed on um, tadpoles or even larval fish. And if you think about it, tadpoles can get fairly large. Um, so the adults will swim. They move their um, hind legs in unison like oars. Um, to breathe, what they will do is they will go to the surface, trap an air bubble, and then keep it underneath their wing until it runs out. And then they can go to the surface, do it again. Um, even though they're aquatic, they do fly pretty well. And terrifyingly enough, they can fly considerable distance in large numbers. So think about all these predaceous diving beetles flying together and they get rather large. Um, the males will have these really distinct front feet um, and they're found pretty much in every body of fresh water um, with that vegetation. This is probably the coolest photo that I have, um, but this is a very close up of a predaceous diving beetle. Um, that's literally the name, not the family. This is just the predaceous diving beetle. They're found near large lakes and ponds. Um, this one, you can see kind of the feathery looking um, parts on it. Um, this helps them move. Um, these guys will feed on aquatic insects. Their larvae look like centipedes. They have six legs. These guys are also predaceous. Um, they are, the larvae are very ferocious. They are predators, they're very aggressive. They will literally eat other things. Um, so these guys, it's just really cool um, uh, images of these animals here up close. They're kind of cute, actually, if you look at them. All right, um, Lucanidae family, these are your stag beetles. So these guys get very large. I'm sure some of you have seen them. Um, they really like oak trees and they have a very high instance. They need dead or decaying wood. Um, so North America has about 24 species. In North America, they get large, about two inches. That's fairly large for an insect. Um, in tropical areas, they can get three to three and a half inches. Um, so again, even bigger. Um, so they're named after the males who in some species have almost like these um, antler-like mandibles that they will use to combat over females. Um, they're usually not brightly colored though because they have to blend into the wood. Um, so usually a typical reddish brown color or sometimes black and they possess antenna with um, 10 different segments in them and they are critical decomposers. One of them that we have in Nebraska is the giant stag beetle. It's the largest insect associated with dead wood in the US. They have these huge mandibles. They reach about two inches long. Both sexes will have the mandibles. Females are gonna be a little bit shorter. Like I mentioned, highly dependent on dead or decaying wood. Um, they will also drink the sticky sap and the honeydew that's secreted by aphids. Um, and then these guys can mostly be found on oak trees, rotting tree stumps. Um, females, when they lay their eggs, the larvae take forever. They take about sometimes a year or more before they molt into their adult form. So again, we mentioned earlier that just different species can reproduce really quickly. Some species take two years, like the tiger beetle, some take one, some are going really fast. So again, just that diversity of species as far as beetles. All right, this is your soldier beetle family. These are sometimes also called leather wings. There's a lot of species um, in the world, but not too many in North America. Um, they're pretty much like the most common beetles that you're gonna find. They eat aphids, they fly really well. They're valuable pollinators. We see them a lot, um, especially in the kind of July, August, September area. Um, these guys can often be confused with um, lantern flies or um, fireflies, lightning bugs, whatever you wanna call them. Um, they do have glands on them at the rear that can secrete these really defensive chemicals. Um, and then the large Larva will mostly live under leaf litter, under stones, but they prey on eggs and larvae, but the adults will usually just feed on nectar and pollen. One that you might be familiar with is the goldenrod soldier beetle. Um, this one's very common. We see it pretty much anywhere. 
they get their name, goldenrod, usually found on goldenrod flowers, but not always. The adults are mostly seen from July to September, but most abundant in August. So coming up, they feed on pollen, the nectar of flowers. Um, they don't harm anything. They don't bite, they don't sting, they don't damage plants. They're just really good pollinators. Um, females will lay their eggs in clusters in the soil, and then um, the larva will look like these worms, and they will be predators um, of other insects in the soil. All right, so that was like just a very hurried um, amount of information on our beetles. Um, I see that we have some questions. I only have about three or four more slides, so I'm just going to go through that just so that everyone gets that information, and then I will um, come back and answer those questions. So these are some beetles that we don't have in Nebraska, but they are doing some really cool things like bioengineering with them just showing how cool they are. Um, so this is called a jewel beetle. Um, a lot of insect collectors and jewelry makers actually like these guys, um, but the way that they use their colors, that iridescence, um, is kind of neat. They use, um, they generate this shiny green color um, with these um, either five, six, or seven-sided cell structures, and the cells will reflect light like a liquid crystal. Um, so this is a huge engineering application. Um, a lot of people are using this for car paints that change color depending on how you view them. I'm sure we've all seen those cars before. And even um, looking at using shiny seals as far as currency. So making them not counterfeit and those special security measures that you see on paper money, this is where they get those ideas from. All right, rhinoceros beetles. Um, these guys are just huge, um, but basically a company um, called DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, in conjunction with UC Berkeley, has basically made them into cyborgs or robots. Um, but what people will do is they've actually fitted them with radio receivers on these really large scarab beetles um, that people can control them. Um, these radio receivers controls the animal and they think that this could aid in like surveillance or search and rescue missions. Um, people will also use these, um, if you know like dog fights, there's beetle fights. People will fight these two together and apparently in Japan, you can buy them from vending machines. So um, that's just an, an interesting fact, I guess. All right, um, harlequin beetles, they have these crazy cool patterns on them, um, but the males will have these really oversized um, front feet that are usually longer than their entire body, uh, but they serve as sexual displays or helps them in climbing trees. And in 2003, French researchers basically isolated in these insects, this fungal agent, um, what they think can help fight um, high mortality drug resistant yeast infection. So um, just from this little tiny beetle, they think this is on the rise and they think that they can isolate that to help those people um, with those yeast infections. So interesting for our beetles. And we also have a Namib desert beetle. Um, if you look at this photo, you'll see it looks like it just got sprayed by some water. Um, so these guys have super special wings that are water attracting and water repelling at the same time. So basically what it does is it grabs water vapor out of the air and it beads the moisture enough on these animals in this really arid environment that the uh, drops will get heavy enough and it rolls down into the beetle's mouth. Um, well, MIT has worked on mimicking this um, collection of water, and they paired with Oxford University, and they believe that they can develop this, especially for people in low water areas or arid environments, um, that they can grab that moisture from dew or fog and have clean water for people to drink. So um, again, looking at all these different types of beetles and the things that they do naturally, and then kind of bioengineering that to help um, people or mimicking that. All right, I cannot pronounce this, but it's a very cool white beetle. Um, they have these brilliant white colors because a lot of people think that they are going to stand out. Well, they're kind of found in this pearly fungi habitat in Southeast Asia. And basically, instead of a lot of animals getting their colors from pigments um, that absorb and reflect light, these guys rely basically on chaos. So the, the filaments are disordered to a point of randomness, um, and the beetle can cause this bright white color on itself um, using structures that are 100 times thinner than common, common synthetic whitener. So um, this might not sound super exciting, but using that, um, they can use the ultra white coating for like office paper, billboards, and they're even talking about it now for like whitening on teeth.
one more, I think. Oh, that was it. All right. Um, so that was it as far as that. Um, I do have three more Science of um, episodes coming up. Next week is Edible Plants. I have Science of Raptors. And then it was this uh, season, sorry, Science of Night Sky Ecology. So we'll be talking a lot about different types of animals, probably again, dung beetles. All right, if you liked this, we do have um, a YouTube channel under the playlist Science Of. And we also have a uh, Facebook page, we have an Instagram page, and we also have just a general website where you can find free downloadable lessons and more information about what we do at Cayman Parks. And then also thank you again for joining me and please uh, join me next week for Edible Plants. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing um, and try to answer some of these questions if they always, if they haven't already been done. So. Yeah, Monica, um, Joe uh, Barbin shared a really cool resource from the Smithsonian Magazine Oh, cool! about um, how eco ecological ge geneticists are trying to find, you know, plant like insect DNA in different plants and stuff. So in the, oh, share the link. Yeah. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. Um, so that link is there. And then um, let's see, I think Kenneth just asked, are those stag beetles found in Nebraska? Yeah, they are. Um, I found a couple and given them to Sean before our um, zoologist and he's like, oh yeah. And I was just like, oh my gosh, they're so cool. They're huge. Yeah. And yeah, it's definitely um, neat to find, but yes, they are in Nebraska. So yeah, I know that was a lot of information for all of you, but I hope that you got kind of just a, we just skimmed the surface on beetles. There's so much we could do like six whole days on beetles and I don't think we'd cover everything. So, um, so like I mentioned, this is recorded and it will be put on our education YouTube channel under that science of playlist. And then I will be sending everyone that um, was on today and also that registered an evaluation and then also some good resources um, that you can um, find. Um, someone I just saw asked about an update on burying beetles in the sand hills. Um, if you check out our Nebraska, um, outdoornebraska.gov, um, main website for Game and Parks. You can find threatened and endangered species, but I will also include that in our um, email that I send out with resources as well, Donna. So awesome. So I'll stay on maybe like 20 more seconds. If anyone has any um, thoughts or comments, I would love to hear them. Otherwise, we will see you next week for edible plants, taking a huge turn from beetles to plants. So not really, but, but really, so. All right. Thank you, everyone. I don't see any more questions, so we will see you next week. Thank you.